had heard. Jesus is so making when Jesus and baptized learned, that the Pharisees had heard. Jesus so when is Jesus, making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. 
others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. We are in week four of our series, What Jesus Serves Up. And it's time to stop dining for a minute and just take a sip of water. I'm thirsty. And I bet you are too. So imagine enjoying a refreshing glass of water that is served just how you like it. Sparkling or tap? Lemon or no lemon? Ice? No ice. Straw or no straw? Evian? Perrier? Topo Chico? Hint, LaCroix, Fiji, Dasani, Waterloo, Ethos, Spindrift, Aquafina. You know, pick your favorite and let Jesus fill your cup. Because in today's text, when we are most parched, we see that Jesus offers us the thirst quencher we need at the very moment we need it. It is custom made for our circumstances, our story. And in so doing this, he refreshes us so deeply that we are able to get up from the table and become the host ourselves inviting others to come and see, to drink and dine, to hope and be healed. To drink of the living water is to drink from a source that never runs out, a source that flows freely into us and through us in such a way that our lives become the stream from which others can drink and be refreshed too. It sounds glorious, doesn't it? It's making me thirstier. But that's good because today's text invites us to allow our thirst to be the thing that keeps us lingering at the table of Christ as long as we can. 42 verses makes for a really long passage in scripture. Well done, Devin. But did you know that the conversation between Jesus and the woman he meets at the well in Samaria is actually the longest recorded conversation in the New Testament? One of the most impactful parts of this passage is the sheer length of the conversation between two people who were never supposed to be talking to one another in the first place, let alone in the light of day for the whole world to see. There is so much meaning in this text, more than I can address in a sermon, but John fully expects us to be comparing this conversation to the one that we read last week. They're almost presented as foils to each other. Not to pit one against the other per se, as if one is good and one is bad, but rather to show us the expansiveness and the inclusiveness of Jesus' love and attention. He talks to anybody, anywhere, at any time. Jesus is fully available to every single one of us. 
And whoever we are and however we come to him and whatever our need is, Jesus stays in conversation with us and offers us his very presence as living water until we are filled up enough that we can go and be the blessing of that beverage for somebody else. So let's look at these two stories. Last week we saw Nicodemus come and seek out Jesus privately in the veil of night, as Morgan so beautifully put it, in Jerusalem, the city of public faith and power. Nicodemus has a name. He's a respected, powerful man. He comes to Jesus on his own turf in the conditions that will most protect him. It's a privilege that he even has that choice, isn't it? To be able to walk around at night safely. And he is a Jew, a Pharisee in fact, a learned teacher, an insider in the faith tradition of Jesus. Nicodemus, who questions Jesus, earnestly or not, we're not really sure at first, he speaks fairly sparsely in that encounter, and he leaves us with the question, how can these things be? And the whole interaction is actually more of a monologue by Jesus than a conversation between the two of them. We're left in last week's text not really knowing if Nicodemus came to belief or greater understanding and faith or not. Perhaps you could say that this teacher was taking a moment to be a student, to listen and learn. He does end up learning, by the way, as we'll see later in John's Gospel. He ends up standing up for Jesus when other Pharisees are putting him down. He even ends up taking Jesus' body off the cross tenderly and placing it in the tomb. Whatever Jesus told Nicodemus that night did indeed transform him, even if it took time. Well, this week, Jesus chooses to travel through Samaria, enemy territory for most Jews, and of course, he's tired from his travels. So he stops in Sychar at Jacob's well to rest. Jesus, a man, is sitting at a place that really wasn't for any man to be sitting at unless they had their eye on a woman for marriage. That's what wells represented in the Old Testament. Rebekah was approached at the well to marry Isaac. Jacob met his wife, Rachel, at the well. Moses had his first encounter with his future wife, Zipporah, at a well. That's just a few examples. And and with those, you can see why when the disciples come back, they are shocked to see Jesus at a well with a woman. It's like that old children's rhyme we used to sing on the playground. Janie and Tommy sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Janie with a baby carriage. Maybe you know that too. Well, just imagine back then the disciples would have been saying, first comes a well, then comes marriage, then comes Jesus? with a baby carriage? I mean, you can see where their minds would have gone. They are shocked about what this encounter might mean. Of course, Jesus never allows the shock of society to cause him to shy away from someone. Jesus was in a land not his own, at a place that really wasn't his to be sitting at, without the the expressed purpose of courting someone. And interestingly, whereas Nicodemus was the one in expressed need coming to Jesus at night, here, Jesus is the one in need. He's thirsty. And a woman who is not named in the text, she comes to the well at noon in the light of day. She's vulnerable and without power in her culture and society. And of course, to name the obvious, she is a Samaritan. 
If Jesus is an insider as a Jew, then she would be considered as an outsider. Or if she is an insider in her land of Samaria, then she would be ostracized now that she's talking to an outsider, a Jew, thus making her an outsider by association. You know, either way, she can't win. She's marginalized. And even though all of these things make the woman quite different than Nicodemus, gender, status, ethnicity, religion, perhaps the biggest difference between the two is their conversation. The woman is actively engaged in conversation with Jesus. And something that begins on a transactional level, Jesus asking her to get him a drink of water, moves quite quickly to a spiritual level as she asks further questions of Jesus about how he can be talking to her in this manner. And, you know, he tells her about the fact that he's the living water, and she says, well, what does that mean when you say that you offer living water, that, that I won't thirst again? She doesn't just accept what he says at face value. She keeps questioning until she starts to kind of follow what he says, and she moves the conversation in a quite biblical and theological direction. She brings up Jacob's well, their common shared ancestor, and that leads them then to a relational level of getting to know one another more deeply. Jesus, knowing the five husbands she's had, sees her, knows the pain that she's in from her past, which leads her to intuit that he's a prophet, one who's able to name truth without personalized judgment. It's a moment of trust building in the conversation. She doesn't feel judged, it doesn't sound that way. She actually feels seen and known, perhaps, because somebody knows her story and is naming it out loud without mockery or embarrassment or confusion. And this leads her to think that not only can he be trusted, but that he knows something about faith. And she starts to ask him about worship styles, how the Jews and Samaritans are different. You know, Jews worship in Jerusalem and Samaritans worship on this mountain. And Jesus, you know, essentially quells all the worship wars in this conversation, both then and now, by the way, by saying that location and style of worship do not matter. What matters is the spirit and truth of your worship, that is, who you worship matters, not how you worship. And all of a sudden, the conversation has gone from theological to liturgical, right? And in response to Jesus' answer about who they're all worshiping, you know, God, this person, the woman then responds with her knowledge to say that, you know, I do know that the Messiah is coming. And then Jesus says, I am he. And that statement is enough to spark an eager curiosity in the woman. But the text doesn't say that she immediately believed him at his word. It does say that she leaves her bucket at the well, meaning she came with one kind of thirst and left without need of that thirst being quenched. For she had experienced a taste of something more lasting. Someone who was willing to be in conversation with her. A woman, right? Someone who Jesus really had no business talking to for all kinds of reasons. Someone who had treated her as an equal in conversation and relationship. And come on, I mean, this conversation is the kind of conversation that I used to have back in divinity school. You know, this deep theological back and forth. This is not an ordinary, everyday kind of conversation. This is graduate level stuff here. And Jesus engages with the woman. So when she goes back to her city, she becomes a witness. And it's not because she proclaims to her people some truth that she has discovered in an absolute form. It's because she invites them to come and see for themselves. And she asks a question alongside them. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? As in, 
is this too good to be true? Well, the people go and they see for themselves what she's talking about, who she's talking about. And of course, at the end of the passage, we learn that many believed because of her invitation to come and see for themselves what she had seen and experienced. It was no longer just because of her story, it was also because of the personal experience they had with Jesus. Her story had become their story too. Do you see how rich and beautiful and complex this conversation is? It moves from transactional to spiritual to theological to relational to liturgical to invitational to evangelical. And I wonder how many of us stay in conversations long enough to get to any of these places let alone one of them. How many of us, particularly when we are speaking with someone who is different than us in every way imaginable, how many of us have the patience and the curiosity to stay in that conversation long enough to let it change us? Transformation happens in this text because of time. Jesus and the woman give each other the gift of time. And you know, I bet the woman was going to the well midday because she didn't want to spend a lot of time there. She didn't want to get caught in conversation with others who drew their water at dawn or dusk when it was cooler. Why? Well, not because of guilt or shame, I don't think, as you might have heard before, but more likely because of grief and sorrow. Look, for a long time, this woman has gotten a really bad rap. If this woman was a prostitute, as you might have heard, you know, the text would have said so, right? The gospel writers aren't ever afraid to name that someone's a prostitute. If this woman needed forgiveness for something, Jesus would have forgiven her or said something to the effect of go and sin no more. Commentators are now working to correct years of patriarchal interpretations that have been layered on this text that have said that this woman is quote unquote, quote, loose. Well, she was married five times. She's not loose. She's either been left because of divorce or experienced loss because of death. Both would cause grief, not guilt. Imagine losing five partners to divorce or death in your lifetime. How painful and lonely that would be. So when Jesus sees her, he is not seeing a woman who is sinning and living in shame. He sees a woman who has experienced untold grief in her life. Five losses, presumably five loves. And now she's in a relationship with another man, and we don't know the circumstances of that. She could be engaged to him. She could be living with someone that she's now dependent upon. Or she could be in what's called a liberite marriage, where a childless woman is married to her deceased husband's brother in order to produce an heir, but you're not technically considered that person's wife, right? There are a number of ways that we might imagine that this woman's story is not scandalous, but just really full of sorrow. To see this woman as one who has experienced great loss in her life, and yet who is still able to drink of the good news that Jesus was offering to her? That's a miracle, isn't it? I don't know about you, but grief can really weigh me down. It can put me in a fog where I feel like I can't connect to others or relate to others. Broken relationships hurt. Betrayal can jade you for life. 
Loss can start to feel all-encompassing. And sometimes when we experience these things in our lives, it can feel like that our lives will never be the same again. That joy will never be ours to taste again. And yet here is a woman who has experienced unspeakable loss in one way or another, and she is able to not only receive the living water that Jesus offers her, she drinks of it deeply enough to then gain a new purpose in her life, if you will, to be an effective witness for Jesus. By learning how to tell her own story in such a way that it invites other people to Jesus so that they can bring their stories to him as well. Truly, once again, John's gospel is showing us that Jesus serves up authentic relationships to us. He has time to sit with us, listen to us, answer our questions, engage with us. He doesn't seem to be in a rush. So why are we? Why are we so often in a rush to get past the circumstance we are in today to get to the next thing, the next conversation, the next person? Why are we restless so often? Sometimes restless for concrete belief right in front of us when really what Jesus is inviting us to is conversation and belonging. Already in John's gospel, we've learned that we can come to Jesus in the veil of night. We can come to Jesus in the middle of the noonday heat. We can go to Jesus in a place we expect to find him, like the sanctuary of a church, or we can be surprised by him when he shows up in our daily lives while we're running errands. We can be someone of learned faith, or we can be someone of no faith, or a different religion altogether, and Jesus meets us. We can be grieving and hurting, or we can think we have it all together and know all the answers, and Jesus still transforms us. However we meet Jesus, he meets us. And this is what Jesus means when he says he serves up the living water. Living water as opposed to stagnant water, right? Stagnant water fits in one mold, one container. It stays in one place. Living water flows from a stream that never stops moving. It has an eternal source with infinite destinations. And those infinite destinations are you and me, the lives of each and every one of us. Living water invites us to not only step into its stream, but to become part of the stream ourselves so that we can offer a drink to someone else too. To understand Jesus as living water is to see him as someone who is continually flowing through our lives, always available to us. We don't have to be in a rush to drink him up all at once. We don't have to worry about missing out. Jesus' well of love and presence is always and forever available to us to all of us, our whole lives long. I think what's most powerful about this text is the length of this conversation. The fact that Jesus stays in conversation with this woman. Her own transformation takes time. It percolates in her. This testimony is not one of immediate conversion. She really just invites others to join her in this conversation. And her faith comes to full strength, not in isolation, but in community. The Samaritan village as a whole ends up asking Jesus to stay with them for two whole days so that they can keep speaking from him. It's not a private encounter like Nicodemus had that stays hidden. This is a public conversation that continues to unfold in community. So both Nicodemus' story and the woman's story offer us an example of encountering Jesus. And in both cases, which are kind of two extremes, 
We see Jesus available and open, answering our question and seeing us for who we are, the uniqueness of our stories. And honestly, in both cases, Jesus could have said no to the conversation, and no one would have thought anything of it. He could have just pretended to be asleep when Nicodemus came knocking in the middle of the night. And when the woman came to draw a drink at the well at the middle of the day, he could have just walked away, or he could have gotten his swig of water and went on his way. No one would have faulted him. Why does Jesus linger so long with us? Sometimes it feels like our lives are so very different than Jesus's. Like we can't relate to him or he doesn't understand our problems, our situation, our world. Yet he never pulls away. He just draws nearer, doesn't he? Today I invite us to think about the fact that we are transformed when we're in conversation with others. If you're feeling thirsty this morning, could it be because you're drinking from the same well over and over again? Could it be that someone who is very different than you, that God places in your life in a circumstance that you're not expecting, could it be that that person is the one that will reflect a new thought to you, a new way of seeing the world or yourself that really turns your whole life around, your perspective around. We don't know unless we stay in those conversations long enough. David White is an author that I've been reading a lot of these days. And he defines the word courage in this way. Courage is a word that tempts us to think outwardly, to run bravely against opposing fire, to do something under besieging circumstance, and perhaps, above all, to be seen doing it in public, right? To show courage, to be celebrated in story, rewarded with medals, given the accolade. But a look at the linguistic origins of courage is to look in a more interior direction. It's from the old Norman French word cor, which means heart. Courage is the measure of our heartfelt participation with life, with one another, with community, with our future, he writes. To be courageous is not necessarily to go anywhere or to do anything except to make conscious those things we already feel deeply and then to live through the unending vulnerabilities of those consequences. To be courageous is to stay close to the way we are made, to our hearts. Friends, we're made to be in relationship with each other. This week, what can you do to stay close to your source, to the relationship that you have with the divine, the living water that made you and that flows through you? I invite you to consider that it may mean drinking from a well that you didn't expect to find yourself at or engaging in a conversation that would have been easier to tune out instead of tune in to. For all of us who are thirsty, my prayer is that we find and drink from the living water that Jesus is offering us through each other, that we might be able to lay down the bucket that we always bring along with us to every conversation, the bucket of all our preconceived thoughts and notions, to lay that down and instead let ourselves be filled by something that's impossible for us to draw up on our own, something that only comes from being in relationship with others. 
If you are thirsty, put down your bucket and try to cultivate belonging with someone new. Amen.